Can you hear me? Oh, great. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Angelo. I, uh, I've been part of the Blender community for about 13 years, and uh, I'm working for a company called Lexet uh, now that does uh, machine learning, uh, data sets for machine learning. So that's, I'm going to give you guys a talk about uh, what we've built on top of Blender and, um, uh, and sort of where we're going. Uh, so last year, Andrew Price gave a talk about funny cat, in, cat drawings. Uh, and there was other stuff in that talk, I guess, but cats seemed like the main topic, so I figured I would follow along uh, with, uh, with that. Um, Andrew told us about uh, AI technologies that were changing the 3D industry. Um, he talked about the rise of procedural tools for modeling and texturing and scene composition. He talked about powerful utilities like AI denoisers and up resing and markerless motion track, uh, capture. Finally, he talked about the possibility of creating uh, augmentation on uh, creativity with generative AIs. And uh, I think these are the ones that are the most extraordinary uh, and have the most uh, potential uh, impact. And it's kind of hard to imagine what uh, the 3D industry will be like once these tools get fully uh, like streamlined and easy to use and available to everyone. The reason I'm telling you this is because I really fully agree with Andrew's predictions. Um, and I'd like to share uh, another side of that story, which is that while the AI industry and, and tools of AI are coming to the 3D industry and changing how all of you do your work, um, or maybe impacting how all of you do your work, then the other side of it is uh, the AI industry is starting to adopt uh, 3D technologies as a way to accelerate and democratize uh, machine learning tools. So what are we going to talk about? I'm going to try to give you a, a quick survey intro to convolutional neural nets. Uh, and then and uh, I'll try my, try my darndest on that one. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges of current uh, AI procedure and methodology. and uh, what we're tr how we're trying to fix that. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about what the future will look like, or might look like. A convolutional deep neural network is a computer program that takes an image as input and gives a prediction as output. Simple as that. Uh, it's trained by showing it thousands of labeled images uh, and it attempts to generalize patterns about those images. Uh, the prediction could be uh, a category, or uh, it could be a pixel by pixel uh, uh, prediction uh, about that image. Okay, so uh, what does it look like on the inside? You have a number of nodes connected, all connected to each other in layers. Uh, at the beginning, we get, we, we get pixel values coming in. Uh, we have some hidden layers that do magic. Uh, and then on the back end, uh, we get a prediction. And it's usually a 0 to 1 value. Uh, inside of each of those nodes, it looks a little bit like this. Uh, you've got a bunch of multiplication and sums and activation functions. And, ah, math. <laughs> Uh, so you might be thinking, why am I showing you all this math instead of showing you more pictures of cats? And that is fair. Uh, the goal of a neural network is to take, uh, uh, to learn a pattern, pattern from some initial labeled examples. And then later, after we do that training, we want to look at an, uh, an image we've never seen before from the real world and be able to predict that same set of things that we trained on. Um, so you might be uh, thinking, what is a convolution? No? Oh, oh well. Uh, a convolution is really just a pixel-based uh, filter. Um, so if you, you know, this is a, it's very hard to see when it's that big. Uh, but uh, th this is a, an edge detect filter, basically, in Photoshop, right? You take uh, 
a, a, a three by three grid of pixels and you multiply each of the, the pixel values by a given number and th those specific numbers are called a kernel, right? Like whatever that, that convolution is doing is called a kernel. And then uh, we output the, the end value, right? Six. And so when you use these numbers, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, eight, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, you get, a, you get an edge detect. And this is basically uh, what's happening uh, in the, in the f beginning layers of a neural network. And the, the, the first layers pick up uh, simple edges and uh, sort of over here. And as we go deeper into the network, the filters end up looking more and more uh, like uh, real items that you might see. But all of the later patterns are built up of earlier simple patterns. So how do we, how does it work, right? Uh, let's say we want to uh, create a, cl a cat classifier. We want to have something where you can point it at something and it'll tell us whether it's a cat or not. Um, you need a bunch of images of cats and a bunch of images of not cats. Uh, if you've watched uh, Silicon Valley, you know uh, this is very similar to a hot dog, not hot dog uh, <laughs> neural network. Um, so you feed the images uh, into the network uh, one at a time, and the pixel values go in, and uh, at the beginning, all of the numbers, the internal parameters of this system are random, essentially. And um, you will uh, get, it'll make a prediction, but that prediction will be terrible. It's random. Uh, and at, so, but the, but the thing is, we know what the right answer is when we feed these images in. We know which ones are cats and which ones are not cats. So when we get to the end, um, the neural network will calculate how far off it is from the correct answer, and it'll step backwards through the layers, uh, updating each one of those nodes, the parameters in each one of those nodes, to try and make its guess better on that, on that answer, and sort of does that across an entire large data set of uh, tens, to, uh, tens of thousands to millions of images. Uh, and at the end of that whole process of going, push, passing a thing through, finding out how bad the answer was and updating and going all the way through again and again and again, we have information in these, these hidden layers that really represent what is a cat, right? It has a visual intuition of what is a cat. Okay, so you're all experts now on machine learning, um, so we can move on. Uh, so what, the thing that's so challenging about uh, the, the earlier uh, way that things were done is that uh, you have to produce lots of images, and, and, and historically this is photo data sets. So let's look at sort of what happens when you use a photo data set. You hire photographers and image annota annotators. You get uh, access to many, many locations to take photos at. You bring lots of objects, randomly place them, uh, you have to take uh, 10,000 plus photos, you consistently change camera settings, you take pictures of rare things because you have to see those things. Uh, you draw Bezier pass around every single object uh, in all of those uh, million, you know, thousands or millions of images. You train your neural net, uh, you find out you're missing something, and then you cry big wet tears because uh, it's very hard to iterate on your data set because it's extremely costly. Um, and really, you have to be a big company uh, to be able to to do this kind of uh, data process. And so what you find is that uh, in the AI industry, mostly people are iterating on the AI architectures themselves and not really iterating as much on the data sets because it's just been prohibitive to, to do that. Um, so how does Blender help fix that? Um, well, we, uh, we set up a system that's uh, fully parametric from end to end, and that includes models, it includes layouts, it includes textures and shaders, um, and uh, you pick all those things, you press a button, you wait for a bit, you get some data back, uh, you train your neural net, you find out something that you were missing something, uh, and then you change one setting, you back, back into our uh, GUI, you change one setting, press a button, uh, wait a little bit, download those images, uh, and buy a snack with all that money that you saved. Uh, by, uh, by not hiring annotators. Um, and uh, so 
I'm going to show you, this is an example of uh, a scene that we, that we generate. So we, we generate the architecture, uh, and uh, Archipack is very helpful for that. Uh, we, we lay out furniture. Uh, Chocofer is uh, very helpful for that. Um, we, uh, we litter stuff across the floor using particle settings, and, uh, and eventually we will, we're working on systems that will learn from photos about human uh, room layouts, so we'll be able to apply machine learning into the actual layout of this system as well. Um, and this is what sort of uh, a sample of some photos from a data set are. You can see they're very different lighting settings, they're different uh, shaders and colorings, and um, this is uh, really important when you're training uh, an AI system. You need, a, you need a high amount of variability and variety so you can learn edge cases. Uh, and so the other thing that we get for free uh, when we use Blender is we get passes. Like, can you imagine trying to take a photo and manually add a depth pass to it? Basically impossible, right? Like, nobody's going to do that. Um, uh, but you get that for free. And there are, are system, you know, there are AI models that can look at photos and predict uh, their, their depth. And this is a way that you can train it uh, very, very effectively. We also get that masking for free. Um, so, uh, again, this is a thing that if you do this the old way, you go onto Mechanical Turk typically and you hire, um, you know, you hire some, somebody across the planet to draw Bezier curves 24 hours a day for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, right? Like, that's how you solve that problem. And it, that doesn't seem like a very good solve to me. Uh, and uh, so that's where we are. Those images were where we are now. This is, this doesn't look great, uh, blown up this big, but. Uh, uh, this is where we're going um, in terms of rendering quality. Um, and the, you know, the, the trick here is we have to uh, balance between render quality and, uh, and the amount of time because we're not just making one image, we're making you know, 100,000 images. But this is all, we do all of our rendering in the cloud, so it's massively scaled. Um, and uh, I just want a big, uh, Shout out, thank you to Chocofer and Polygon for existing because, you know, we uh, could not exist if it weren't for community projects uh, in the Blender community. There's so many amazing add-ons and resources. And I can't even name all of the ones that we use, but um, this we we we're a small team. I'm, uh, we're you know three engineers, and so there's no way we could build all of the tooling that we would need to get this thing done. And so we rely and you know hugely on open source projects and and Blender being like uh, the thing that we're built most on top of. Um, I told you, I showed you uh, this image of the cat with the pixel-based uh, thing, and I uh, just want to show you some video of a system. Oh, it didn't, uh, didn't play. The, 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 uh, the, well, if this were playing, it, it's basically doing a, a real-time mask of the floor trained from one of our data sets. Um, and so we've proved that. Uh, we can get uh, close enough to a real photo uh, it for, the, for the machine's sake um, in order to train these kind of networks. OK, so what will the future look like? Um, this is some work uh, uh, done by DeepMind, which is part of Google. Uh, and what's going on here is th this neural network has been given that single image, that single observation image, and it is uh, extrapolating, it's guessing about the shape of that entire scene from that one viewpoint into the scene and allowing you to move around in that scene without, it doesn't have any scene graph, it's just, uh, it's just photos and it, and it knows what that entire scene looks like. And so I think that, you know, this looks rough today, and it is, but this will be, uh, will be working on ray trace quality images in the not too distant future. And I think that's a, really big change to how a lot of us work, uh, potentially, because this is essentially runs in real time. Uh, and so this is where the AI industry is today. You know, there's lots of janky stuff. <laughs> uh, this is some more work by DeepMind. Um, but this is, where it's, uh, this is where it's going. I don't know if you've seen this. This is wild.
<laughs> so uh, uh, that's my talk, and uh, thank you very much. You can, uh, you can reach me at my email here. Uh, and if you're interested in talking more about uh, Blender or AI or the robot apocalypse, uh, just uh, find me after, after the talk. Thanks.